So pay special attention to this uh, slide because this kind of gives you, in a nutshell, all the functions, at least in brief, of the various organs. So this is kind of a good review for you. And then let's look at the whole digestive system. It consists of two portions. One is a tract. That means it has a lumen. So it's like a pipe which is enlarged in certain portions. So that is known as the alimentary canal or also when we call it the digestive tract or it's also known as the gastrointestinal tract. Tract means like this, like a lumen, having a lumen this way going all the way through and coming out, okay? Associated with this alimentary canal are accessory organs which connect to it by means of ducts. And these, are, these accessory organs are mainly glands. Um, the liver is kind of also a glandular structure, so you'll see that they pour their secretions into the alimentary tracts. So they develop with this alimentary canal. And then another important thing is in the tract you have sphincters. This is very similar to the cardiovascular system where you had a one-way flow, remember, in the cardiovascular system. So similarly here too, you want substances to go from the oral cavity all the way down and then come out through the anal canal. So wherever there is a change from one part of the tract to the other, you have a sphincter to make sure that food just passes forward and doesn't go in a backward direction. So as an example, there are four main sphincters that you see here. The esophagus opens into the stomach. So at that point where the esophagus opens into the stomach, you will <clears throat> you'll have a sphincter at this point, which is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, and, Or is also later we'll see, it's also known as the cardiac sphincter because that area where it opens is known as the cardiac opening. So this is often also known as the cardiac sphincter, okay? The next is the stomach opens into the small intestine and the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. So where the stomach opens into the duodenum, you have another sphincter there which is called the pyloric sphincter to make sure that food goes from the stomach into the duodenum and not the other way around. The small intestine then opens into the large intestine. That part of the small intestine which opens into the large intestine is known as the ileum and it's opening into a part of the large intestine called the cecum. So again, there is a sphincter in this region which is called the ileocecal sphincter between ileum and cecum. Okay, so again, you can see, go make sure food goes from ileum into cecum. And then through the large intestine food, uh, the, the undigested food is uh, passed out through the anal canal, but then again, you want to make sure that it's only passed out when the time and the place are convenient. So you have sphincters in the anal canal, and these are anal sphincters. They, there's a voluntary part to the sphincter, and there's an involuntary part to the sphincter as well, okay? So let's take a look at this short video, which kind of shows all these organs. In the digestive system, the mechanical action of teeth grinds food down into smaller particles. And the chemical and wetting action of saliva begins the breakdown of starches into more digestible sugars. The food is pushed through the esophagus into the stomach, where gastric acids and muscular churning continue the chemical and mechanical digestion of proteins in the food. In the duodenum, food continues to be digested by the action of other pancreatic and bile secretions. The digested food is absorbed by the body as it passes through the small intestine and moves through the large intestine and rectum. So that was a quick review of, you know, the various organs, and we'll examine each one in detail. So let's first start with a question. Which of these is an important common feature of the accessory organs of digestion? not working? Okay, let me try. Let me just go back and
Okay, let's try again. No? ahead. Yes, very good. They all pour their secretions into the digestive tract. These are exocrine glands, so they don't produce hormones, okay? And nothing there mentions that they have a poor blood supply. So they all pour their secretions into the digestive tract. That's why they're called accessory organs. They're not in the tract. Now, just like when we did the heart and we did the lungs, remember you had pleural cavity surrounding the lungs and you had the per uh, pericardial cavity surrounding the heart. Similarly, with the abdominal organs, you have this huge cavity which is known as the peritoneal cavity. And all the organs, unlike lungs and heart, which, where it was only one organ, all the organs kind of invaginate into the peritoneal cavity. So if you notice, here is the peritoneal cavity. And here's one organ which is kind of pushing into it. That pushing is known as invagination. The way it pushes into the cavity is it kind of pushes so deep that it, it has a lot of, it has a fold of peritoneum. You can see this double fold of peritoneum which allows this organ to kind of be mobile, you know, like this. It can kind of move around a little bit. This double fold of peritoneum is known as mesentery. Now, in the abdominal cavity, you don't have just one organ pushing in. You have many organs. So here only two are shown. But there are so many organs that what happens is it's not possible for every organ to kind of push inside and have this double fold of peritoneum allowing it to kind of swing in the peritoneal cavity. So as these organs start invaginating, some of the organs get kind of plastered to the posterior aspect of the abdominal wall. This area here is the posterior abdominal wall. So some of the organs are kind of pushed back like that. So notice how the, uh, this organ, which is other organs will, be, will kind of invaginate from here. They're pushing this organ to the back. And see what happens. When it goes to the back, this, this part of the peritoneum disappears. So this organ is only covered by the peritoneum in the, on the sides and in front unlike an organ like this, which is covered by peritoneum all around. Can you see that? This organ like this is only covered by peritoneum on the sides and in front. Such organs are known as retroperitoneal. Retro meaning behind. Such organs are called retroperitoneal organs. Okay? Examples of such organ we'll see in the next slide are the pancreas, the duodenum, um, the aorta, we also have the ascending and descending colon. So all of these organs, therefore, when you go to the lab or you look at a picture, what you will see is unless you remove all the organs with, with the mesentery, you cannot observe these. So that's why if you look at the lab, you look at the model, you have the small intestine covering the pancreas and the duodenum. Only after you remove the small intestine, then you can observe the pancreas and the duodenum. And I think I mentioned in class that pancreatic cancer was one of those cancers which is usually has a poor prognosis because it's diagnosed late. One reason for late diagnosis is because it's on the posterior abdominal wall and it has all these organs covering it, the swelling is not seen or felt as soon as any other organ might uh, show that. So with the result, it spreads. And by the time it has spread and a person actually displays symptoms, it has spread rather far. And then the prognosis becomes really bad. Here are some of the functions of peritoneum, very similar to any serous cavity. Um, it is protective in nature, and since it has serous fluid in it, it provides lubrication. In the peritoneum, because of the presence of this mesentery, it allows for mobility. And this mesentery is also a passageway for blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics because the aorta lies here, so that's how it sends its blood vessels through the mesentery. 
and the presence of this mesentery also divides the peritoneal cavity into compartments. You can see there are two compartments here. This helps to localize infection should there be infection in anything. So infection doesn't kind of spread generally all over the peritoneal cavity. So let's look at this peritoneal relationship in a sagittal section. So this green layer is the peritoneum. The part lining the inside of the abdominal wall, both the anterior abdominal wall and then here on the posterior abdominal wall, this part will be known as parietal peritoneum. You can see the label up here. And then this parietal peritoneum goes and lines some organs entirely where it will be called visceral peritoneum. Notice how some of these organs are hanging by this mesentery. So you can see here's one mesentery, here's another one. All the in small intestine have the mesentery up here. And then notice some of these organs like the pancreas, the duodenum, the aorta, you can't see the colon in this picture. They just lie behind the peritoneum. Notice how they are lying behind the peritoneum. So they don't have this fold allowing the organ to be suspended within the peritoneal cavity. So these organs are called retroperitoneal. And these which have the mesentery, are just called intraperitoneal, okay? Now, this double fold of, of peritoneum, which I call mesentery, has different names in different areas. When it's related to the stomach, we call it omenta. So, there's a smaller omentum and there's a really big fold. So, this is called lesser, this is called greater omentum. In relation to the small intestine, it is known as mesentery itself. In relation to a part of the colon, the transverse and sigmoid colon, instead of calling it mesentery, we call it mesocolon. But they all mean the same thing. They're just double folds of peritoneum, which you can see allow blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics to pass through. They suspend the organ. So you can see because of this curtain-like double fold, this organ can move about, whereas this is plastered on the posterior abdominal wall. This or these organs cannot move, okay? So which of the following organs, if you looked at that picture carefully and you listen to me, which of the following organs is not considered retroperitoneal? Stomach, yes, very good. All of the others were plastered behind, so pay attention to that. Um, picture that you saw and you saw how they were plastered behind. Okay, let's look at the blood and nerve supply of the gastrointestinal tract. This is rather important, the blood and nerve supply, because the tract is very, very richly supplied with blood, a lot of anastomoses going on. And you did some of these arteries when we were doing the circulatory system, so you're kind of actually reviewing that again. And then the nerve supply in the gut, this is called the enteric nervous system. Enteric means the gas, small intestine really, but otherwise it usually refers to the gastrointestinal tract. And it's often known as the gut brain, or like you can see up there in the picture, the brain in your gut. In fact, they say there are more neurons in the gastrointestinal tract than there are elsewhere in the brain and spinal cord. Okay. And this gastrointestinal tract, it has its own sort of plexus of nerves, which is influenced by the parasympathetic and sympathetic parts of the autonomic nervous system. So let's look at the blood supply first. So if you remember, when we did the blood vessels, the aorta had three main branches, which came out from the ventral surface of the aorta. These might ring a bell. The three branches were called the celiac trunk or also known as celiac axis. The second branch was called superior mesenteric. And here you can see why it's called mesenteric because it lies in the mesentery. Remember the mesentery was that double fold of peritoneum whose function was to have blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics pass in it. And the one below that is called inferior mesenteric. So the celiac trunk supplies the gastrointestinal tract in the abdomen, so the lower part of the esophagus, only a tiny part of the esophagus lies in the abdomen, otherwise most of it lies in the thorax. So from that lower part of the esophagus till the middle of the duodenum, which you can see here, till the middle of the duodenum is the celiac axis. 
then from the middle of the duodenum till up this point if this is the trans this part here is the transverse colon so you divide it into right two thirds and left one third so about that point there so superior mesenteric is all of this area from the lo lower half of the duodenum till the right two thirds of the transverse colon and inferior mesenteric is from the left one third all the way down till the anal canal so the, this is the arterial supply and whichever area it is going to supply the branches which come off are automatically named accordingly so you know a, a branch going to the spleen would be called splenic a branch going to the duodenum would be called duodenal branch going to the stomach would be called gastric okay branches going to the colon would be called colon uh, colic the venous drainage is through the portal system if you remember there was something called the portal vein which carried all the blood from the GI tract to the liver so that new because the nutrients are absorbed in the GI tract and you want the nutrients to first go to the liver so that the liver can metabolize that and then from the liver hepatic veins take it and push the blood into the inferior vena cava and that's how it gets back into the right atrium so that is the arterial supply the nerve supply as I said numerous plexuses and there are in the layers of the gut we saw the layers of the gut there were four layers if you remember there was mucosa submucosa muscularis externa and then the serosa or adventitia which was the outermost layer there are two plexuses present one is present in the submucosa which is called the submucosal plexus the submucosal plexus is also known as the Meissner's plexus and the way you'll remember it, SS and submucosal, Meissner's plexus. And in the muscularis externa, between the inner circular and the outer longitudinal. So there are two layers, the muscle layers. One set of muscles goes circularly, another set of muscles goes longitudinally like this. So between the two layers, which you see here, is this plexus called the myenteric plexus. Both these plexuses are for supply of the muscle because nerves supply muscle. They are for supply of muscle both in the muscularis externa and the muscle in the muscularis mucosa, the thin layer of muscle there. And also for supply of glands, so to cause, cause secretion from the glands and blood vessels in that area. All this while, wherever we have done, whatever we have done so far in the respiratory system and we did cardiovascular, we always talked about sympathetic more because sympathetic had more positive actions there. You know, in the respiratory system, it caused bronchodilation. In the cardiovascular, it increased the heart rate. It increased the contractility of the muscle. So it was always sympathetic that we were talking about. Now, in the gastrointestinal tract, because this is a tract which is kind of going to act when you're at rest right now as you're sitting in class, here the parasympathetic reigns supreme so the parasympathetic is the system which causes which acts on the muscle and causes constriction of the muscle or contraction of the muscle so uh, food or feces gets passed forward so muscles contract in waves that which is called peristalsis the parasympathetic one is uh, which is the one which acts on the gland so secretory activity is done by the parasympathetic muscle contraction most of muscle contraction is done by parasympathetic except for sphincters which are kept closed by the sympathetic nervous system the sphincters which we will see later the sphincters are kept closed by the sympathetic nervous system so it causes contraction of the sphincters and the sympathetic acts on the blood vessels the, it constricts the blood vessels okay so that's the action of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic that's how they act or influence this gut brain so let's take a question like this where I haven't really told you names of all arteries but here is how you think critically and think which of these organ artery pairs do not match
Very good, yes, pancreas, you would call it pancreatic, right? Why call it accessory? You'd call it pancreatic. So that doesn't matter, but everything else you can see matches. Good job. So here let's look at the histology. I thought I'd done this before, but let's look at the histology. So there are four layers which you see here. From inner to outer, when we go inner to outer, the innermost layer is called mucosa which has an epithelial lining, which you can see here. And in the gastrointestinal tract, based on whichever region it is, if it, there is more friction, you will have stratified epithelium, for example, in the esophagus and anal canal. But elsewhere, where the epithelium is more secretory, you have columnar epithelium, where you need a lot more lubrication or you need neutralization, you'll have goblet cells thrown in there, okay? So the epithelial lining, then under the epithelium is, is an area of loose connective tissue, which is called lamina propria. And then beyond that is a thin layer of muscle, which again has an inner circular and an outer longitudinal. So this has an inner circular and an outer longitudinal. So this is called muscularis mucosa or muscle of the mucosa. So you can see it's an extremely thin layer. This is responsible. The reason it's present there is any small glands present in that area. This can kind of help to squeeze a little bit, though the glands usually have cells called myoepithelial cells around them. Glands always have cells called myoepithelial cells. So imagine if you have a gland like this. This is the duct portion, and here is the glandular portion. There will be a little cell which is present here called myoepithelial. So this is what is stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And what it will do will squeeze the gland so that it pours its secretion. So muscularis mucosa helps to a certain degree. And the other thing it does is it will cause local movements, just movements up here, local localized movements of the surface epithelium. That's, what, that's all that this muscularis mucosa can do. Second layer is called submucosa, which has that nerve plexus. Lots of glands present here. Many regions show mucous glands. Others may not show them. But if they are present, most of the glands are present in this region. It's also rich in blood vessels and nerves. It, is con it has connective tissue, so it's kind of acts as supportive. Because of the big blood vessels present here, this is what provides blood supply to the muscle up here and then goes on till the epithelium. Next layer is muscularis externa. You can see the inner circular, outer longitudinal. Notice the myenteric plexus between them. This is what is responsible for bulk movements, as you can see, because if this muscle contracts, notice it's going to squeeze the entire gut like that. So it'll, it's responsible for waves, which are known as peristaltic movement, okay? And that's why you have this big nerve plexus present there. And then the outermost layer, if there is peritoneum covering it, it will have serosa, that serosa is for peritoneum. In some organs which do not have peritoneum around them in certain parts, there you have just connective tissue which is called adventitia. Now I told you these nerve plexuses are rather important because they are responsible for supply to the muscle and to the glands. There's a condition called Hirschsprung disease where actually these, this plexus, this is absent and this is in the lower part of the colon, absent in the lower part of the colon and upper part of the rectum. So lower colon and upper rectum, these, this nerve plexus is absent. So what do you think would be something that the patient would present with? And obviously it would be a child because congenitally it is absent. It doesn't go away after birth. It's just not formed, not developed. So what do you think the child might present with? Excellent. Constipation, did you say? Yes, very good, because the waves would come down, but then at this point, the colon is devoid, so the waves, the muscle cannot contract any further, so you'd see that area over there, there'd be constipation. So you actually, this, you can't do anything. It's not like you can put a nerve plexus inside. So you really have to resect or cut that part of the segment which has no n neurons in it and then just attach the two ends which have that. It's a, a disease which is seen, um, it's not uncommon to see this in children who are born and the patients, the parents will come with a child not giving complaints of not being able to pass 
stools normally. So I told you the action or the uh, function of these layers. I purposely left out the mucosa and I told you what were the various parts. So what do you think would be the answer to this question? Excellent. Generalized bulk movements, the mucosa is not going to be able to do that. All of these are functions. And this is where you must always look back on your ANP1 knowledge. Remember in ANP1 you did tissues where you did epithelium. One of the functions of epithelium is it lines the internal surface of organs. So it, it is the one which is next to the lumen. So therefore, secretion will occur from the epithelium. In fact, it's this epithelium which goes, invaginates, and forms glands, which you can see up here. So it's, if the glands secrete, they come through here and go into the lumen. So secretion is one. Whatever in the digestive tract, whatever is, whatever you eat, and then the secretion goes, the hormones, enzymes, and other things go, they digest that. That's going to be absorbed into the blood vessels, but it has to first go through the epithelium. So absorption is another function of the epithelium because that's the one that is closest to the lumen where all the digestion is occurring. Generalized bulk movements won't be possible because remember that's going to be done by this muscularis externa which is on the outside. Muscularis mucosa can only act on just this part. So it's only going to cause localized movements like if you look at the surface of the stomach or something you might see a little sort of, um, you know, waving activity or a little sort of small movements over the, you know, general epithelial surface. Do you have a question? Um, hunger pains are different. Um, those hunger pains are actually when the whole muscle contracts because that your gastric juices get secreted kind of every, almost every three hours. And it's expecting that to occur. So then the whole muscle, uh, or the outside muscularis externa is the one which is contracted. Yes, that's it's trying to act again. There's nothing inside, so it's yeah, it's trying to act, where, but there is nothing it can move forward. Okay. You don't want too much air actually in your stomach because then that can cause colic. So let's take a look at this one. Good. It's not responsible for peristalsis. Peristalsis is a wave-like movement, which is part of the muscle. The submucosa has only connective tissue. So it does provide support, connective tissue. It does contain this nerve plexus. Remember I said Meissner's S and S submucosa does contain glands, which you saw from that previous picture. So that's why it's really important to look at these images carefully. And muscularis externa is the one which is responsible for peristalsis. So let's say you get a question like this. I'm already making you surgeons without you even pushing a knife. So what would you incise? Think carefully on this one, okay?
very good yes he would obviously if there's an obstruction you're going to go from outside so the first layer you're going to incise is the serosa before you actually get to the lumen yes excellent let's now look at some histology of the accessory glands so we look at compare pancreas and salivary glands you all remember we already did the pancreas the endocrine part of the pancreas when we were doing the endocrine system we saw that there were these islets which were discrete cells and these were kind of interspersed between the exocrine portion which is made of what are known as acini so just to go over what is an acinus again so if this is the surface epithelium of any gland it goes in it dips in the dipping in is known as invagination and when it dips in at the end it becomes sort of round or flask shaped it may be it may be even more complicated than that it may go like this this part becomes is known as an acinus this is the secretory portion and this part is just the conducting portion where it's called the duct so when you take a section through the secretory portion like this what you will see is round structures like this which are lined by really tall cells because you want them to be tall because they need to secrete so you need need a lot of cytoplasm you may or may not see the the acinus really well in the case of a duct which is this one here so this is a duct you see because the duct only conducts so you need a large lumen so you'll see that the cells are not as tall now in an acinus where which is secreting a thin watery fluid such an acinus is known as a serous acinus it takes up the stain really well in an acinus which is secreting a thick mucus like secretion that's called a mucus acinus and histologically mucus acini because we, when we uh, process the tissue we use alcohol that removes the mucus so the cell the whole acinus actually looks like adipose tissue it looks empty looking because the mucus is removed so they're not well staining so in the case of pancreas notice you have well staining uh, acini so pancreas contains the exocrine portion of the pancreas contains only serous acini when you look at the salivary glands we have three types of salivary glands or three main types of salivary glands we have something called submandibular then we have parotid and we have sublingual submandibular parotid and sublingual the parotid is entirely serous producing so it looks very similar to the pancreas the only difference is you will not see islets and you will see fewer blood vessels because it's not an endocrine gland so parotid can be differentiated from pancreas because no islets fewer blood vessels the sublingual gland is entirely mucus producing so you will see acini which are very very light staining like up here these here this part here so they'll all be made up of very light staining acini like this the submandibular is what is known as a mixed salivary gland that means it has both mucus and serous so if you can remember m for mixed so submandibular is mixed and this one is an example of a submandibular gland where you can see dark staining acini which are serous you can see these light staining acini which are mucus there's a little bit of adipose tissue also here and then you see ducts up here you can see these large ducts notice how well the lumen is seen up here okay so that's the difference between salivary glands and pancreas then let's look at the other accessory organ which is the liver and in the liver if you remember we i said that the portal vein brings blood from the gi tract to the liver and actually it breaks up into many branches where it pours its blood into these branches which are called sinusoids and these all these are in the liver and then from these sinusoids they'll all sort of 
So let me do it this way here. So portal vein goes to the liver. And when it goes to the liver, it kind of opens into huge channels which are called sinusoids. So that the liver cells are exposed to these sinusoids. And then they take all their nutrition. Then these sinusoids lead into veins which are called central veins. So all of the sinusoids will lead into central veins. Central veins will lead into what are known as hepatic veins. And hepatic veins will finally drain into IVC because the blood has to get out of the liver also, right? You're taking nutrition, but then you want to send the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So portal vein, ideally, in everywhere else, remember veins either finally open into superior vena cava from the upper part of the body or inferior vena cava from the lower part of the body. But from the GI tract, we said there was a difference because the GI tract had nutrition. The vein was had deoxygenated blood, but it was rich in, in nutrients. So you want to first take it to the liver, and then the liver takes all the nutrition, and then you send the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So see the, the detour that it takes. Portal vein, instead of going directly into IVC, it goes into the liver where it opens into structures called sinusoids. The hepatocytes are exposed to the sinusoids. They take all the nutrition. The blood moves forward into central veins from where it goes to hepatic veins, which finally leads into IVC. So let's take a look at this. So if you look histologically at the liver, the liver looks is formed of hexagonal lobules. So they're six-sided lobules. The center of each lobule has a central vein. So we can look up here. This is a central vein which is present in the central of the lobule, center of the lobule. And from this, you have the liver cells which kind of branch out or radiate. These liver cells, anything to do with liver has the word hepar, so hepatic. These liver cells are known as hepatocytes. So they radiate from each side. In and these liver cells, if you look at them this way, can you see they are lying like plates? In between the plates of the liver cells are these sinusoids which are present. So notice how all the sinusoids are opening into the central vein. And inside the sinusoids, you have special cells which are phagocytic, which are known as Kupffer cells. Because the portal vein may be bringing in some cell debris, some pathogens which you need to take care of. The liver also produces bile. So bile is one of the one of the functions of the liver is production of bile. So the bile has to move out in separate channels, which and anything small, any tube is called a canal. If it's really small, it's called a canaliculi. So notice how the little you have little canaliculi present bet, between hepatocytes as well, so that the hepatocytes can make bile, the bile passes out from those canaliculi and then it will go into something known as a bile duct or a branch of the bile duct. And then finally, at each corner of the lobule, you have, uh, you have three structures which are present. And because you have three structures, this is known as the portal triad. And at the portal triad, what you have is the portal vein. Remember I said the portal vein opens into the liver, right? So you have the portal vein or a branch of the portal vein. You have a hepatic artery because the liver needs oxygenated blood also. Every organ needs an artery and a vein to it, right? If you have an artery, you have to have a vein to it. You can't just send it only an artery and not get blood out of it. So an artery, which is the hepatic artery, a portal vein, and you have a bile duct, okay? So let's now, so I went backwards like this. So let's go this way. So coming to the liver is the hepatic artery. There are many branches of the hepatic artery. All these branches of the hepatic artery arrange themselves at the corners of this hexagonal lobule. Also coming to the liver is the portal vein. It also divides into many branches. They also arrange themselves as branches along those lobules. So at every corner of the lobule, you'll have these branches of portal vein. And then the hepatocytes produce bile, which has to come out of the liver. So, at the, again, at the corners, you have big ducts, which are branches of the bile duct. They'll all finally end up to form the bile duct. So, blood from the hepatic artery passes, comes to the liver, and it enters, as you can see, into this sinusoid. Blood from the portal vein 
comes to the liver carrying nutrients, it also pours its blood into the sinusoids. So the direction you can see is this way. So from all these sinusoids, blood will go into the central vein. From the central vein, notice it will go to hepatic veins. And hepatic veins will finally lead, you'll have about two or three hepatic veins which will lead into the inferior vena cava which will finally take it into the right atrium and back into circulation. Bile from the hepatocytes, bile which is formed by the hepatocytes travels in the other direction. So bile from the hepatocytes travels out. travels in this direction through these little canaliculi and opens into the bile duct. So there are many of these very, very small bile ducts and they'll all form together and we'll see what they do later. So this is very, very microscopic. So let's take a larger view of one region of the portal triad. So here is the central vein. Here are the hepatocytes. Here is a sinusoid between plates of the hepatocyte. Here is a bile canaliculus. So notice how the hepatocytes produce bile and they pour it into a little bile ductule. Here is a branch of the portal vein which is pouring blood into the sinusoid. Here is, so it is nutrient rich blood but it's deoxygenated. So all the nutrients will be taken by the cells like this because they are lying close to the cells. And then the deoxygenated part will go into the central vein. Many central veins will join and finally form hepatic veins. Here is the arterial blood through the hepatic artery carrying oxygen. So now the liver cells can get oxygen as well. And they will, then this blood after giving oxygen will travel towards the central vein and again get out through the hepatic veins. So having looked at this picture, answer this question. What does the blood in the sinusoids contain? Okay, the correct answer is arterial and venous blood. And I showed it to you and I mentioned it. So let's go back. Look at this picture. See this here? Can you see venous blood in the sinusoid? Can you see arterial blood also in the sinusoid? So that actually in the sinusoid there is a mixing of blood. And here's the reason why. The liver cells need oxygen. So that's why the arterial blood is going to the liver. But they also need to remove nutrients from the vein so that they can take care of the nutrients because they can, you know, metabolize them, form proteins, form glycogen, form fatty acids, all of that. So, would, and I told you once that the body does everything very, very economically. It doesn't like to waste any resources. Both vena, this venous blood and this arterial blood has finally got to go to a vein and that's how it's going to get out of the liver. Remember, arteries go into form capillaries which uh, form veins and then they get out. So pouring both of them into the sinusoid, the hepatocytes now get exposed to both blood, both streams of blood and actually the streams kind of remain more or less separate so that they can take nutrition from the venous blood, they can take oxygen from the arterial blood and then send the blood forwards towards the central vein. So can you see that? It can do both things at the same time and so therefore they send this towards the central vein. The bile duct does not open into the sinusoid. Notice it is separate. If you open the, if bile opened or bile was present in the sinusoid, what would happen? It would contaminate the blood, right? You never want blood to be contaminated. That blood will be in your circulation. You'll have bile running around your circulation. You don't want that to happen. So that's why here you have both arterial and venous blood in the sinusoid, okay? Let's look at oral cavity and tongue. There's really not much to this. Take a look at the picture so you can see this oral cavity and the various parts to it. 
and in the oral cavity of the opening of the three salivary glands which I just described earlier, the parotid gland, it opens in the upper second uh, near the upper second molar tooth, the submandibular gland which is present just below you can see peeping under the mandible and then here is the sublingual gland. This one's labeled. Oh, that's a duct. Here, this part here is the sublingual gland. And it opens by means of many ducts along a little sort of fold which is present. If you lift your tongue up, you see those folds. And when you have mumps, you've all, you've all had, have been immunized, I assume, against this disease called mumps. Mumps is a disease of the salivary, it's a viral disease which affects the salivary glands. And um, they swell, and it you know usually this area is uh, the parotid gland is often infected, and it causes a lot of pain because the the connective tissue over the gland is so thick that it does not allow the gland to really swell too much. And so uh, when you see a person with mumps, they look like chipmunks because they you know this this part up here is really really swollen. Mumps in childhood is bad enough. But when it occurs in, oh, in per someone who's an adult, especially males, it becomes a bit problematic because it leads to inflammation of the testes, which is um, called orchitis, and that can lead to sterility. So, when a, so that's why immunization is really, really important. From the oral cavity, we come to the pharynx, and we, when we did the respiratory system, you remember we did this part, and here we, we are not concerned with the nasopharynx, we are only concerned with the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. Um, and again, when we did that, remember the, when you swallow, what happens is that this soft palate goes up like this, so it closes off the oropharynx from the nasopharynx so that food doesn't go up into your nose. And this epiglottis comes down this way, so it closes this, so that food can just pass down into the esophagus and doesn't go into the trachea and uh, larynx and then trachea and down below. Then we move on to the esophagus. Most of it, as I mentioned, lies in the thorax. So you can see that most of it is lying in the thoracic region. Just a small portion up here passes through the diaphragm. There's an opening in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. So it opens through something known as the esophageal hiatus in the diaphragm. This opening here in the diaphragm is called the esophageal hiatus. Where it begins, at the lower end of the pharynx, where it begins, there is a sphincter present, and this is called the upper esophageal sphincter. So this is circular muscle is thickened over here. So this is called the upper esophageal sphincter, where it passes through and connects with the stomach. Remember I said at every portion where one part meets another part of the gastrointestinal tract, you have a sphincter. So now here the esophagus is opening into the stomach. So at the lower part, you have another sphincter, which is called the lower esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter is anatomical. That means there is actually a circular muscle fiber thickening. The lower esophageal sphincter is something which is known as a physiological sphincter. That means if you look at it, anatomically there is no change. Physiological means it's just by pressure. When the pressure Usually, normally, when you are not swallowing anything, this is kept closed up here because the pressure in the stomach is more than the pressure in the esophagus. But as you swallow, as the bolus comes down, pressure here builds up, so it opens this, so the physiological sphincter relaxes, allows food, the bolus of food to get into the stomach. So, therefore, it's just by on basis on pressure. There is no anatomical thickening over there, okay? So, that's what we mean by lower esophageal sphincter being a physiological sphincter. The esophagus lies just posterior to the left atrium of the heart. So if I was to draw the heart up here, at this point here is where the left atrium is. So this is a very important relationship because if the left atrium was, was to be enlarged, what would happen? It would cause difficulty with swallowing, right? Because esophagus is lying just behind it. So patients with left atrial enlargement, they may have something to do with the heart, 
their first symptom that they might come with is difficulty swallowing. They might say, oh, I have to swallow, and you, you know, do all the check, do everything with the uh, gastrointestinal tract, everything is normal, you must always look for some problem with the heart. Uh, you may all have heard of a disease called gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's what GERD stands for, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So this is a condition, uh, because of this sphincter present, this physiological sphincter, normally the lower end of the esophagus is kept closed. It only opens when the bolus of food comes down. And we all know that the stomach produces acid. Sometimes, however, what happens is that if this physiological sphincter is not working properly or we have some a condition which is called hiatus hernia. Hernia means a protrusion of an organ through an opening. So if this, since it's passing through this opening, through the opening in the diaphragm, if this opening was very large like this, what can happen is a part of the stomach can also pass into the thoracic cavity. That's called a hiatus hernia, okay? So then acid from the stomach can go and irritate the esophagus and you might end up with esophageal irritation. The mucosa of the esophagus actually changes then and you get something known as Barrett's esophagus. Whenever any part of, any part of the body is constantly irritated, it can be, that area can become prone to carcinoma. Constant irritation may change the mucosa, the epithelium in that area. So if acid from the stomach keeps irritating the esophagus, it can keep, the epithelium might change and it becomes more like the stomach and that's a precancerous condition which is known as Barrett's esophagus. So let's take a look at the lower sphincter and also at GERD. So notice how the valve closes, so I'll, it was really short, so let me play it again. So now it opens only when food comes at this part and then it closes off again so that it prevents food or acid or food from going back. And let's look at the situation of... Okay, one last time. Oh, it was the same thing. Okay, I apologize. I thought it was, I did have GERD there. Well, I'll next, I'll show you next time. Let's look at the process of swallowing. And this kind of describes this whole thing. But this picture, this uh, video explains this really well. So pay special attention to this. And then you all can read these various phases that we have. Swallowing occurs in two stages, the oropharyngeal and esophageal stages. At the start of the swallow, a food bolus is voluntarily pressed by the tongue up against the roof of the mouth and backwards towards the pharynx. In response to activation of pharyngeal pressure receptors, the swallowing center in the medulla initiates reflexes that prevent food entry into respiratory passageways. The uvula contracts which blocks the nasal passages from the pharynx. The laryngeal muscles contract, closing the glottis at the top of the trachea by tightly aligning the vocal folds. The epiglottis swings down upon the closed glottis. With all airways blocked off, respiration is temporarily inhibited. As the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, pharyngeal contractions drive the bolus into the esophagus. The oral pharyngeal stage is done and breathing resumes. During the esophageal stage, a primary wave of peristalsis initiated by the swallowing center pushes the bolus through the esophagus. As the bolus travels through the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, allowing the food to enter the stomach. If the bolus is sticky and adheres to the esophagus, secondary peristaltic waves triggered by the intrinsic plexus at the point of distension completely clear the esophageal lumen to finish the swallow. So that video kind of explains everything that's written up here and shows really well. And this is the reason why they say don't talk when you are swallowing something because uh, the larynx, as you can see, is closed. If you start talking, what will happen? The larynx will open and that bolus, some part of that bolus might go into your larynx. This is also the reason why that part of swallowing is involuntary. 
because remember it said respiration is closed at that time so if it was voluntary then and you took all the time in the world to swallow what will happen you your breathing would be stopped for a really really long time okay so these are two really important things to do yeah it is very quick it passes even though it's skeletal muscle it is very quick and it's un, not under your control it's involuntary because since respiration is stopped you have to pass that wave really fast and come down when you look at the histology of the esophagus because it is prone to uh, friction because you eat food of all temperatures and textures so the epithelium is stratified and non keratinized at the gastroesophageal junction it it abruptly transitions to columnar epithelium in other words the stomach becomes columnar and the esophagus is stratified squamous non keratinized so no, notice this abrupt junction that you see up here the lower third of the esophagus being close to stomach has mucus glands so that and this is a protective mechanism so that should any acid pass through it can neutralize that and prevent injury and in the esophagus because all of the organs usually have smooth muscle but in the esophagus there is a transition so when you look at the muscle layer the muscularis externa and you divide it into thirds the upper third is skeletal the middle third is mixed where smooth muscle is coming is more of smooth muscle is seen and then the lower third is entirely smooth muscle so even though the upper third is skeletal that is involuntary because you want the peristaltic wave to pass really really fast then from the esophagus we get into the stomach so when you look at the stomach when you're looking at the gross anatomy of the stomach you can see it's kind of um, the shape as we usually describe it as j shaped it has two openings the opening with the esophagus is known as the gastroesophageal opening or also known as the cardiac opening or also known as the esophageal opening different names for it okay so cardiac opening gastroesophageal or just gastric opening any of these three are used so this is where the esophagus enter enters the stomach exits and passes into the duodenum so at this end is another opening which is called the pyloric opening this has a sphincter around it remember that sphincter was physiological whereas the pyloric opening notice how you have this smooth muscle which you can really see which is more in num, uh, amount so there is a definite increase in circular muscle fibers here so the pyloric sphincter is anatomical it is curved the stomach into there's a smaller curvature and a greater curvature so this part is known as the lesser curvature this entire area is called the greater curvature the stomach has to churn and mechanically digest food because after the esophagus that's where the, the food first comes and more enzyme action starts here though a little bit starts in the mouth but a lot of enzyme action occurs here so therefore it is very very muscular so it has three layers of muscle the outer longitudinal inner circular like it is everywhere else but now you have an extra innermost layer of oblique muscles just so that the churning action can occur really fast then when you look at the parts of the stomach there is an area this of course is the cardiac opening if you take a line across this this part which is above the cardiac opening is known as the fundus of the stomach usually the fundus contains air the stomach lies in the epigastric mainly in the epigastric and left hypochondriac regions it can come down into umbilical maybe even lumbar but these are usually the two regions so this lies along the left dome of the diaphragm and usually you'll see air under the left dome because that's air in in the fundus of the stomach the highest point always in anything air always rises to the top right so that's why you have gas present here this area here the dilated portion is called the body of the stomach this leads into something called the pyloric antrum which passes into something called the pyloric canal so this whole part is known as the pyloric region so there's an antrum the pyloric canal and then this goes into the pyloric sphincter this is the area where the sphincter is present you'll see a lot of glands present in the stomach 
some in the pyloric region, but most of the glands are, sorry, a lot of glands present in the body and in the fundic region, also in the stomach, in the pyloric region, but most of them tend to be kind of congregate, congregated in this area, the body and the fundus of the stomach. The main function of the stomach, we all think it is digestion, but the, actually the main function of the stomach is production of something called intrinsic factor. And this is important for vitamin B12 absorption. So B12 is absorbed from the stomach. And that B12 absorption is important because vitamin B12 is needed for maturation of red blood cells. Let's take a look at hiatus hernia. This is where the stomach kind of protrudes. This animation will show how a hiatus hernia forms. There are two types of hiatus hernia, sliding and rolling. This animation focuses on the more common type, a sliding hiatus hernia. Click the navigation arrows below the animation screen to play, pause, rewind or fast forward the animation. Your esophagus, the pipe that goes from your mouth to your stomach, passes into your stomach through a hole or hiatus in your diaphragm. Normally, the stomach is situated completely below the diaphragm, as shown here. The esophageal sphincter acts like a one-way valve to stop the acid that's produced in your stomach to break down food from flowing up into your esophagus. Here, we show the valve opening and closing. In the sliding hiatus hernia, the sphincter and the top part of the stomach push upwards into the chest. A hiatus hernia can prevent the esophageal sphincter from closing properly. If this happens, acid from the stomach can pass into the esophagus and cause discomfort, known as heartburn. However, often hiatus hernias don't cause any symptoms. Sliding hiatus hernias are usually quite small. They can slide back and forth through the hiatus, so symptoms can come and go. Sometimes, sliding and rolling hiatus hernias are present at the same time. This is known as a mixed hernia. This is the end of the animation. So you saw in that rolling hiatus hernia where the stomach along with the esophagus, the stomach was lying side by side. Most of these, uh, they may not cause any symptoms, but when they do, when they cause heartburn, that's what is called gastro gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. So this kind of shows you how GERD could happen. This his let's look at the histology of the stomach. So when you look at the surface epithelium, it's it has columnar cells which produce mucus. There are no goblet cells in the stomach. The columnar cells themselves produce mucus. This then invaginates and forms glands. The part where it goes in, this opening is known as a gastric pit. This area would be the duct of that pit. And then when it goes down here, this is the area of the gland. And in this gastric gland, you have different types of cells. And each particular type of cell produces different substances. One is this epithelium, epithelial cells themselves produce mucus. Then down here in the gland, you have mucus neck cells because the stomach produces acid. So if you had nothing to protect the stomach from itself, it could eat away, right? The stomach itself could be digested. So you have to have a layer of mucus which will kind of act like a barrier from the acid attacking the stomach itself. So that's why you have so much mucus production. Then you have cells which are called parietal cells. These parietal cells you may see in your books. These are also known as auxintic cells. So another word for parietal is called auxintic cells. These auxintic cells produce HCL and intrinsic factor. So these parietal or auxintic cells produce hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Then we have another type of cell called chief cells. Chief cells produce an enzyme which is in an inactive form. That enzyme is called pepsinogen. And pepsinogen needs an acid medium to get activated to pepsin. 
which is why the stomach produces hydrochloric acid. Because you might wonder, what is the reason for the stomach to produce acid? That's because this pepsinogen is produced. The pepsinogen needs an acid medium, and then it gets converted into pepsin. And pepsin is important. It's an enzyme. It's important for protein digestion. When we do physiology, we'll look at that. So that's the second cell. When we did endocrine system, if you remember, we talked about glands, and then we also talked about discrete cells present in various organs which produce hormones, right? Like, for example, we said in the atrium, atrial walls, we had cells which produced ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, right? Now, in the entire gastrointestinal system also, we will have special cells which produce hormones. Since they are present in the gastrointestinal tract, we call them enteroendocrine cells. Entero means gastrointestinal tract. So we have these special enteroendocrine cells which in the stomach produce a hormone called gastrin. So gastrin is a hormone which is produced. Pepsinogen is an enzyme which is produced. Enzymes act on substrate and they cause changes in the substrate. Hormones, you will find that gastrin, what it does is it causes, <coughs> it regulates the activity of these chief cells and parietal cells. So it stimulates the chief and parietal cells to secrete their HCL and pepsinogen. And it also acts on making sure that the gastric motility, that means the stomach can contract, so it acts on the muscle also. So that's the function of gastrin. Now, you may have heard of people who have what is called gastric ulcers. For a long time, it was thought ulceration is nothing else but where surface epithelium is eroded. You get an ulcer formed in that area. For a long time, very many, many years ago, they used to think it was because of excessive acid production. But now we realize it's not because of that, but because of a bacterium which actually lives in all of us, but in some people the bacterium is increased in amount. That bacterium is called Helicobacter pylori. And what it does is it disrupts this mucus barrier. And when it disrupts this mucus barrier, acid can pass between the cells, other bacteria can pass in, and they kind of destroy the cells and they cause the ulcer formation. Okay, So people who have... Uh, gastric ulcers now are actually treated with antibiotics to keep the to bring down the level of Helicobacter pylori. Of course, after they've diagnosed that, that's the reason why they have ulceration. So let's look a little bit at histology of the stomach. Mm -hmm. People have said that ulcers. Upon closer examination of this. Yeah. From stress, oh, I was going to give me ulcers. Does that have nothing to do with it? No, stress also can cause ulceration because people with excessive stress, surgeons are one good example, is because it increases cortisol levels in the body, it increases epinephrine production, causes vasoconstriction, so slight degree of ischemia. It also increases gastric acid secretion, so that's why they have. Stomach. The muscular folds called rugi that make up the stomach lining are clearly visible. The rugi gradually smooth out as the stomach fills, permitting stomach distension. A cross-section of the stomach lining reveals that in between the rugi are gastric pits, which are the openings of the gastric glands. The gastric glands are lined with different types of cells that contribute various components to gastric juice. Chief cells and parietal cells make up the gastric gland. Pepsinogen is secreted by the chief cells, and the parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen into pepsin. Pepsin is the key component to gastric juice and is a potent digestive enzyme. By splitting protein molecules into even smaller parts, pepsin begins the digestion of proteins. So one thing I forgot to mention, and you can see from the previous slide, that the inside of the stomach is not, an empty stomach is not smooth. You'll see that it's kind of thrown into folds. These folds are called rugi, and these allow for expansion of the stomach. So when the stomach is full, these folds kind of get ironed out. And you'll see similar folds present even in the urinary bladder when we'll do that. Again, just for allowing expansion. Yeah, uh, what happens when they do a bypass? Okay, 
The question was, how do they do by, you know, you have what is called gastric bypass surgery. Whenever you do gastric bypass surgery, you kind of actually uh, do, just keep a small portion of the stomach, like just a small area. And then from here, the intestine kind of gets connected this way. So food travels this way. So all of this area no longer kind of is available for, uh, so your stomach volume becomes very, very small. It does affect, you can have what's called dumping syndrome, you can have problems, which is why you have to eat very, very small meals. One is your stomach can only hold so much, you also have to eat very small meals just so that you can have problems because of that. So, do they take that part out? No, no, they leave it, no, no, it's just, it. yes, yes, yeah. Well, it, it, many of these people have it for a while, the, the pouch can keep enlarging. So if they've lost their weight and they've kept it off, maybe they can go back and have it, you know, have everything come back to normal, but most people tend to kind of leave it back that way. They also put the ring. They, yeah, they have many ways of doing it. Sometimes the ring is more like temporary, so you can remove it, yes. Okay, so let's take a look at these questions. Stomach produces HCL. So logically, which parts of the GI tract do you think would have mucus glands to neutralize the acid? And we looked at the various parts of the GI tract right at the beginning when we were doing that. Uh, the correct answer is 2 and 3. And here's why. Remember I told you that the body is very economical, does not want to waste resources. If the esophagus, here's the esophagus opening into the stomach, which becomes the duodenum, and then this becomes jejunum and ileum. You should remember this from the first thing, right? Stomach is producing acid. It can go up. It can go, it will go into the duodenum because food, from the stomach goes into the duodenum. So here you will definitely have glands, mucus glands to neut mucus is alkaline, it will neutralize the acid. In the duodenum, which is the first part which is receiving that acid, you have glands to neutralize the acid. There is no reason for those glands to continue all the way down because it's already been neutralized over here, which is why you see these mucus glands only in the lower end of the esophagus and the and the duodenum, not in the rest of the small intestine, okay? So let's take a look at this one. Parietal cells of the stomach produce HCL, an intrinsic factor. What do you think lack of intrinsic factor would do? Yes, anemia, very good. In fact, it causes a type of anemia which is known as, anybody? Pernicious anemia, yes. This type of anemia is called pernicious anemia. Very good, yes, it causes pernicious anemia. We did that when we were doing blood, okay. Next, we look at small intestine. So it has three parts to it. So here's the C-shaped duodenum. From the stomach, you enter the duodenum, and then you have all of this really curved, um, highly wavy rest of the small intestine broken up into jejunum, which is the proximal two-fifths, and then the ileum, which is the distal three-fifths, and then the ileum opens into the large intestine, and it opens into that part of the large intestine called the cecum. So again, there is a valve present between them, so that food passes one way. That valve is called the ileocecal valve. 
Of this, the duodenum is retroperitoneal. Remember, we said amongst the retroperitoneal organs, whereas the jejunum and the ileum have a mesentery. So here you can see the mesentery present, which suspends the jejunum and the ileum. So these are highly mobile um, organs, the jejunum and the ileum. So in fact, when you do surgery, they're kind of all over the place, and you really have to push them out of the way to, in, if you want to kind of look at the pancreas or the duodenum because they're lying right up there in front. So let's look at the duodenum, some features of the duodenum. So it's C-shaped. It's about 25 centimeters long. So we say there's a first part, there's a second part, third part, and fourth part. Um, it, all of the small intestine has actually folds inside. Just as the stomach had those rugae, these were temporary folds in the stomach because they got ironed out. But in the small intestine, which includes the duodenum, you have these folds which are present. You can see these folds. These folds are called circular folds or also known as plicae circularis. The word plicated means where you get folded. That's called like the word plicated means folded, and they are circular, so they go around in, on the inner circumference of the uh, small intestine. So in the duodenum, you see these plicae circularis. And up here in the second part of the duodenum, this is where two major ducts open. Remember the accessory organs of digestion pour their secretions into the tract. So here the accessory organs were um, the stump, uh, the pancreas and the liver and gallbladder. Liver produces bile, which it sends to the gallbladder for storage and concentration. Then when the body needs, needs it, it comes out of the gallbladder and travels down the bile duct. Pancreas produces a lot of enzymes and bicarbonate, so it has its own duct. So together, the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, they open into the duodenum. And where they open, there's kind of a little swelling present, which is called the major duodenal papilla. And these two ducts open together at the major duodenal papilla. And again, where they open, you do not want bile and pancreatic juice to be uh, pouring into the duodenum all the time. So again, they are guarded by a sphincter, which is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter or also called sphincter of Odi. So that when food enters the duodenum, then that sphincter will relax and it will allow bile and pancreatic juice to come in. So we will be going over these ducts again, but right now this is just an introduction of these where you can see where these ducts are opening. Then when we come to the rest of the small intestine, jejunum and ileum, and also the duodenum, histologically you will find that the, all of the small intestine, because maximum secretion and absorption occurs in this part of the digestive tract, in the small intestine. So therefore, to increase the surface area, so instead of having a plain surface like this, if you threw the surface that into various folds like this, projections, you can increase the surface area. So these projections are known as villi. This is lined by cells. If each cell is further thrown into folds at the surface, you can further increase the surface area. So this is known as, these are called microvilli. So these broad projections are known as villi. And then when we take each cell of the villus, if I take one cell, imagine this is a cell, and instead now I do this, can you see I've increased the surface area even more? So if you look under the microscope, these the microvilli, they look they give a very fuzzy brush-like appearance. So that's why they're often called brush border. The microvilli are called brush border. So we see in the entire small intestine that you throw the surface into projection. So you've increased the surface area. Each cell has these microvilli. So you further increase the surface area. Plus, if you also send in downward dips, which are known as crypts, you can, you can see that in that same area, you're increasing the surface area even more. So you can see we have three or four things which increase the surface area. One, we have these folds. 
So more folds in the same given area, your surface area will increase. Then you have villi, which increase the surface area. Then you have microvilli, which increase the surface area. And then now you are throwing it into downward projection, uh, downward invaginations, which are actually glands, but they have a special name. They are called crypts of Liberkun. So these also, you can see, would increase the surface area. The other thing that these circular folds do is because they are present there, you can see they can hold back food because of the, you know, they're kind of forming little sort of um, walls like this. They hold back food. They don't allow food or, di you know, the kind to pass through really fast so that they allow the action of the enzymes to occur for a longer period of time. This kind of act like little blocks over there. Also present in the uh, small intestine, you have Peyer's patches, which we saw when we did the lymphatic system. So these were lymph follicles present within the wall. And in the center of each villus, you have blood vessels, as you can see, but you also have a lymphatic channel present here, shown in green. That lymphatic channel is called a lacteal. And lacteals are important because I told you in the small intestine, this is where all absorption and secretion occurs. So all carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are absorbed. Fats are not normally absorbed into the bloodstream. They go into lymphatic channels. That's why you have these lacteals for absorption of fat. So fat which is absorbed, most of the fat enters the lacteal, which is why it is present in the center of a, a villus. The cells that we have up here in the lining the epithelium, we have columnar cells which are present. We have goblet cells now. They produce mucus. We have enteroendocrine cells which are present. These enteroendocrine cells produce hormones, which you will see when we do physiology. The hormones are many, but two which we talk about are cholecystokinin and secretin. These are two main hormones which are present, which are produced. And then we also have antibacterial or cells which produce antimicrobial substances known as panith cells. So they're not kind of labeled up here, but panit cells are present here in the crypt. So, you know, you can draw it anywhere. So panit cells are also cells which are present in, which are in the part of this lining of the crypt. Mucus glands present, special mucus glands apart from these goblet cells are only present in the duodenum, which we said, remember, in the esophagus and duodenum. In the duodenum, they have a special name. Those mucus cells are known as Brunner's glands. So let's just take a look at villi. <clears throat> Each villus contains a network of blood vessels and a small lymphatic vessel known as the lacteal. Some products of digestion, like amino acids and glucose, pass into the blood vessels and then into the hepatic portal vein, which carries them to the liver. Most fatty acids and glycerol are recombined to become fats in the intestinal lining and are absorbed into the lacteal. The fluid in the lacteal passes into the lymphatic vessels and is emptied into the bloodstream. So if you remember, we had the thoracic duct, which was taking um, all the lymphatics. So these lacteals all join up together, and most of the fat actually goes into the thoracic duct. So since we've done the small intestine, let's take a look at this question. So answer this question.
Okay, yes, it is all of the above. Remember, these cells were part of the epithelium. They went over the villus, which was a projection. They went invaginated. That became a crypt. So remember, the epithelium does all of this. It secretes. So here, all of this is secretion. It absorbs. So even absorption in the small intestine will occur through the epithelium. So it does all of this. Let's now look at the accessory organs of digestion. So the first three, which is the liver, gallbladder, and bile duct, are together called the hepatobiliary apparatus. Hepato for liver, gallbladder, and bile duct, biliary apparatus. And then the other gland is the pancreas. We already did the salivary glands, which are also accessory organs of digestion. So when you take, take a look at the liver, it has two main lobes called the right and left lobes. We have two smaller lobes as well called the caudate and quadrate lobe, but we won't pay attention to that. And externally, those two main lobes, the right and left, are divided by a peritoneal fold which is attached here. And this is, that fold is known as the falciform ligament. And it actually contains the obliterated left umbilical vein which is there in the fetus. It contains that in it. And the liver has various functions. One of the functions of the liver is to produce bile, and that bile has to ultimately reach the second part of the duodenum. So it produces bile, which you saw when we were looking at the bile canaliculi. Remember when we looked at the histology of the liver at the portal triad, you had those bile ducts, which was actually a ductule. So, you know, the bile is poured through the canaliculi. They go into those little ductules which are present at each corner of the hepatic lobule. Then those bile ductules join and they get larger and larger till they finally form two ducts, one from the right, one from the left lobe, called right and left hepatic ducts. These two ducts, right and left hepatic ducts, if you pay attention, they'll join together and form a duct which is known as the common hepatic duct. From here, the bile travels by means of a duct called the cystic duct, and it goes to the gallbladder. Because you don't want this bile to be coming into the duodenum all the time. So you want a place to store that bile. So therefore, after the liver has produced it, it actually takes it to the gallbladder through a little duct here, which is known as the cystic duct. And this gallbladder lies in a little, there's a little kind of depression in the liver called the fossa for the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is kind of lying against the liver in that fossa. It has a dilated part here, which is called the fundus. Remember when you looked at the stomach also, you had a dilated part, that was the fundus. And then this area where it narrows up here is called the neck of the gallbladder, and that leads to the cystic duct. So initially, bile produced by the liver travels this way, goes into the gallbladder. In the gallbladder, the bile is stored and concentrated. It's concentrated to about 50 times. All the water is removed and it gets highly concentrated. Then when bile is needed, when somebody eats, and usually a fatty meal, bile then, this concentrated bile now reverses its pathway. It pa passes out from the gallbladder back through the cystic duct. And here it comes into the bile duct, and we'll see later how that bile duct is formed. Or actually, even in this picture, you can see the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct together join to form the bile duct. It's not called the common bile duct, it's just known as the bile duct. And this bile duct, if you notice, it passes, it pass, actually passes through the pancreas, and it opens into the second part of the duodenum. As it's coming into the duodenum, it actually is joined by the pancreatic duct because both of them have to pour their secretions into the duodenum. So it's a good way to have a common opening instead of having separate openings for them. So let's take a look at the pancreas. We did the pancreas when we were doing the endocrine system. I mentioned there too. It lies, as you can see, in the sea of the duodenum, has this large part which is kind of completely uh, lying in the sea. This is called the head of the pancreas. This narrow area here is often called the neck of the pancreas. This main area here is called the body of the pancreas. And then this part, which is related to the spleen, is known as the tail of the pancreas. The tail was the area where? What was present? The eyelets of Langerhans. That's the area where, which has the maximum concentration of the endocrine part of the pancreas. In the pancreas, you usually have one main duct 
This duct is called the pancreatic duct. It has another name to it called the Worsung's duct. Sometimes, occasionally, you might have another duct present, which you can see here. That is called the accessory pancreatic duct. It's not always present, okay, the accessory pancreatic duct. So this pancreatic duct, you can see here, joins the bile duct, and together they open in the duodenum. There, if you look at the surface of the duodenum, within these plicae or circular folds, there's a little projection, a little bump there or, or called the papilla, and that's known as the major duodenal papilla. If this accessory duct is present, it opens into a separate papilla of its own, which is called the minor duodenal papilla. The papilla is just a bump which where this opening is seen. These two, the ducts, the bile and the pancreatic duct, are guarded by a sphincter because, again, remember, we don't always want bile and pancreatic juice to keep pouring into the duodenum. So they are guarded by a sphincter, which is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, or also known as the sphincter of OD. So this is also called this. This part here is also called the sphincter of OD. Where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct, so if here is the bile duct and this is the pancreatic duct, where these two join, that part is a little dilated before it opens into the major duodenal papilla. This is the papilla here. This area where they open is a little bit dilated. This is known as the hepatopancreatic ampulla or also called ampulla of Vater. And it's around here that you have the sphincter which surrounds this part here. That sphincter of OD or also called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So let's take a review. Let's look at how this duct system is formed. So right and left hepatic ducts coming from the liver join to form the common hepatic duct. The gallbladder is present here. The gallbladder has the cystic duct. So cystic duct joins the common hepatic duct. Together they form the bile duct. The bile duct passes down through the pancreas where it joins the pancreatic duct, the main pancreatic duct leads into that dilated end called the ampulla of Vater and opens at the major duodenal papilla. And here the opening and even around the ampulla you have the sphincter present which is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Okay? So the pathway of bile would be initially it would come this way, go into the gallbladder to get stored and concentrated when needed. It will come down like this and into the duodenum. At that point the duodenum, the hepatopancreatic uh, uh, sphincter has to relax, only then bile will come in. Most of the time it's kept constricted by the sympathetic nervous system. Then when it relaxes, the bile flow, bile and pancreatic juice will flow into the duodenum. Okay? Here are some functions. I've al already told you about gallbladder some other functions of the liver, bile and bile salts production is an, a very important function. Metabolism of protein, carbohydrates, fats goes, occurs here. So which is why I told you that all the nutrition, nutritive blood in the portal vein goes to the liver first before it goes into the general circulation. It's also an area where vitamins are stored. And vitamin K becomes extremely important because it's responsible for forming clotting factors. And a lot of clotting factors are formed within the liver. So another function of the liver is to form clotting factors as well with the help of vitamin K. For example, like your prothrombin, fibrinogen, all of that, remember, that's all also formed in the liver. It detoxifies drugs and alcohol, which is why someone who is an alcoholic drinks a lot of alcohol. You kind of almost wear out the liver, and that's why they end up with cirrhosis. And also phagocytose, bacteria, and debris, which might come in, which is why you have which cells phagocytose the bacteria? Yes? Kaffir cells, is that what you were going to say? No? Okay. The Kupffer cells which are present in the sinusoids. Remember there were cells lining the sinusoids. Some of these cells are called Kupffer cells. Kupffer cells. Okay. K-U-P-F-F-E-R-L. 
E R S. Sorry. Pancreas has an endocrine function, which we did earlier. The exocrine function is it secretes enzymes, and it secretes enzymes which digest all three food groups. That means carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. When we do digestive physiology, you will see that um, each part of the gastrointestinal tract produces a particular enzyme which can only digest one food group. But the, the pancreas is one organ which produces en enzymes which can digest all three food groups. So that's a very important function. It also produces bicarbonate because it helps to neutralize the acid which comes from the stomach. You know, the stomach contents come into the duodenum. Pancreatic juice goes into the duodenum. This juice contains bicarbonate. So along with the Brunner's glands which are present in the duodenum, this bicarbonate helps to neutralize the acid and you'll see where this neutralization becomes important because these uh, enzymes they only act at a certain pH so in the stomach we have an acidic pH because that's the pH at which the enzyme acts in the mouth in the oral cavity the pH is very close to neutral as well as in the small intestines so you obviously need something alkaline there to neutralize the pH okay Okay, so let's take a look at some questions. Uh, the tail of the pancreas was removed accidentally. So what do you think this is going to like, this is likely to result in? Yes, it's going to cause a condition similar to diabetes mellitus. Digestive enzymes will still be secreted. You've only removed the tail, so the, the asini present in the pancreas will be there. In fact, what happens is it becomes a very, very terrible situation because imagine here you have the pancreas, you've cut this. So can you understand this end of the duct is going to be open, so all the digestive juices are also are going to actually pour out into the peritoneum, so it will auto-digest. So it becomes a really, really terrible situation there. Uh, bile is produced in the liver, not in the pancreas. So cutting the tail of the pancreas off is, has nothing to do with bile production or secretion. Then let's look at the large intestine. The various parts of the large intestine begins with the appendix. The appendix actually has a mesentery attached to it, which is called the mesoappendix. From the appendix, the next part you go to is the cecum. And then the cecum leads into the ascending colon, which turns around and becomes the transverse colon. At, it two, at its two ends, the right side and the left side, you can see how it's turning, so it's kind of flexing over itself. So this is called the right colic flexure. This is in relation to the liver because this is where the liver is present, like this, this area. So that's why this is called the hepatic flexure. And at this other end, this is where the spleen is present. So that's why this area is called, the, the left colic is called the splenic flexure. The cecum and appendix do not have, they are retroperitoneal. Peritoneum just goes on the sides and over them. Transverse colon, however, has an, a, a mesentery attached to it, uh, which is called the transverse mesocolon. So these don't have a mesentery. The cecum and ascending colon, transverse colon has a mesentery. It's called transverse mesocolon. And then when it comes down, it, it becomes a descending colon, which again, is retroperitoneal, so just covered by peritoneum on the sides and in front. This leads into the sigmoid colon, which again has a mesentery. And then sigmoid colon comes down into the anal canal. And then the anal canal has a sphincter, because again, you do not want to be passing feces all the time. You want to only when the time and place are convenient. So you have two sphincters which are related to the anal canal and the rectum. There's an involuntary internal anal sphincter, which is involuntary, and an external sphincter, which is voluntary. When you look at the large intestine, it is shorter 
than the small intestine. The diameter is more. But the large intestine looks puckered up. Because, remember, um, in the walls of the intestine when, uh, or walls of the GI tract, we had four layers, right? You had muscularis externa, which had an inner circular and an outer longitudinal. In the case of the large intestine, the longitudinal layer, it is thickened in three areas, like it forms three bands, and in between it's much thinner. So those three bands are known as tinea coli. So these are, this is one band, so there'll be another band on this side, maybe another band on that side. So you have three longitudinal bands, and these are parts of the longitudinal muscle fiber, which is thick in this area. In between the longitudinal, in between this band and the band next to it, the longitudinal muscles are, the layer is much thinner, okay? So these three bands are shorter than the length of the large intestine. So with the result, it kind of puckers up the large intestine. Can you see that? This puckering up of the large intestine creates these little sort of pouches. These pouches are known as sacculations or also known as haustra. So these are called haustra or also called sacculations. Attached to the tinea, you can see these little sort of tiny little projections. These are fat-filled globules which are known as epiploic appendages or appendices epiploici. These, these are just a storehouse for fat here, epiploic appendages. So this, this is just an area where fat can be stored in the body. The mesentery also is an area where fat is stored. This is another area where fat is stored. Since the ileum connects to the large intestine, because small intestine will then lead into the large intestine, the last part of the small intestine is known as the ileum. Where the ileum connects to the large intestine, again, you need a sphincter. Remember I said wherever one part goes into the other, you have a sphincter. So where stomach went into small intestine, you had a sphincter, the pyloric. Now small intestine going into the large intestine, you have another sphincter which here, which is known as the ileocecal valve. So this also will allow a one-way flow of contents from the small intestine into the large intestine. And all the undigested food comes into the large intestine. By the time it's passed out of the small intestine, food has been digested, absorbed, and what is left is undigested food. So that undigested food then passes through the large intestine. And having this haustra actually helps because then the undigested food is kind of kept in those pouches and passed slowly. So as it passes through those pouches, water can be absorbed. One of the major functions of the large intestine is to absorb water and then so that the feces which pass out are solid. Otherwise, you would have the feces coming out as being very, very liquid. So absorption of water is very, very important in the large intestine. Another thing in the large intestine, especially in the cecum, you have bacteria. These are what are known as symbiotic bacteria. That means they are helpful bacteria. And you may have heard of the probiotics that a lot of people take. These symbiotic bacteria are helpful because they help to produce vitamin B complex, which your body can ab absorb. So they produce, they, from the undigested food, they take their nutrition. So they take from the undigested carbohydrate, they take their nutrition. So they take something from us. And in return, they produce vitamin B complex and vitamin K. And our body absorbs that. So, you know, that's how we live in symbiosis. This, these symbiotic bacteria are also called intestinal flora. These become particularly important when people are put on large, um, on antibiotics, especially what are known as broad-spectrum antibiotics, antibiotics which can act over a broad range of bacteria, and especially for a long time. Because those antibiotics will destroy the bacteria they were meant to destroy, but they also destroy the symbiotic bacteria. So often people who have been on antibiotics for a very long time might find they get mouth ulcers. You know, you get a little ulcers in the mouth. That's because uh, B complex is needed for cells which are rapidly dividing. Your epithelium is a rapidly dividing type of tissue. 
And then if you deprive it of B complex, you kind of, you know, you're depriving the cells don't regenerate as fast. So therefore, it's always a good idea when someone's on large, on long time, broad spectrum antibiotics to take extra B complex on the side so that, you know, you had what the, what you were getting from here and the rest of your diet, you're kind of supplementing it with that extra because these bacteria are killed. The other thing is that the large intestine contracts and it pushes by peristalsis, it'll push the undigested food through the entire large intestine before it's finally expelled. Now, its, it's contractions are very, very strong. So inside, the volume must be enough so that the contractions can kind of ha have some resistance against which they can act, Pe which, in, which is why uh, fiber in the diet becomes very important. Fiber adds volume to your f undigested food and your feces. So when it passes, so fiber will pass through all of your gut without being digested, and by the time it comes into the large intestine, it's still undigested, and it's adding vo volume to it. So that helps so that the intestinal uh, contractions are now, if, you're, if you have enough volume in your large intestine, they're going to contract against something. So there's that resistance which is provided. Instead, if you don't have fiber in your diet, imagine the amount present inside your large in the amount of undigested food, which will finally become feces, is very little. These intestinal contractions are very strong. They have nothing to contract against. So what happens when they, their strong contractions usually ends up causing little outpouchings like this, which are known as diverticula. And these diverticula can get inflamed when you get something known as diverticulosis which is why they, everybody tells you that you must have a certain amount of fiber in your diet so that you add bulk to your feces, providing some sort of resistance against which the, intest, the large intestine can contract. So here, the lowest, the last part of the large intestine, the rectum and the anal canal, I told you there are two sphincters present. There's an internal anal sphincter, which is involuntary. There's an external anal sphincter, which is voluntary. The epithelium is very similar of the large intestine, very similar to the small intestine, where it is columnar with a lot more goblet cells, because you need a lot more mucus to lubricate the passage of feces. And, but, but except that you have no circular folds, villi, or microvilli. But when you come to the anal canal, histologically, in the anal canal, the epithelium becomes like the oral cavity, so it's stratified, squamous, non-keratinized. Because now the feces has to pass out, so there's friction which is present, and you need a thick epithelium to protect it. In the anal canal, you can see uh, there is an anastomosis of veins which drain into the portal circulation and veins which go into the systemic circulation. So you remember when we did the soft figures, I said you could have something when we were doing cir uh, the circulatory system. We had, uh, so let me go over this again. So in the anal canal, you have a part of the blood vessels which go into the portal system. And from the lower part of the anal canal, blood vessels go into the systemic circulation. That means finally they'll go into the inferior vena cava. So blood flows in two different directions. From here it goes up. From here, it comes down. Normally, that's how blood flows. So in this middle area, it's like a watershed. Blood is flowing in two different directions. Suppose there is some problem in the portal circulation, like someone has portal hypertension or something. So blood can't go to the liver. So this area is blocked. So what happens is the blood actually now opens up these anastomotic channels, and it starts passing through here and gets this way. So in this area now, you have more blood flow than normal because normally there should be no blood flow. There should be a watershed line, right? Blood flowing above and down below. So more blood flows through this, and that's what leads to what is known as internal hemorrhoids. You may have heard of people who have bleeding through the rectum and anal canal, and that is because one of the cases is because of this portal system being not functioning. The other could be maybe even systemic circulation is not functioning, so blood reroutes its way this way. This kind of thing is known as internal hemorrhoids. We have the same situation occurring even in the esophagus, because the esophagus is also an area where you have blood vessels, part of blood vessels going to portal system, part of blood vessels going to the systemic 
meaning to the inferior vena cava. If there's a problem, either way, the blood will now reroute itself, and so through that area, blood will flow where it normally shouldn't flow, and the blood vessels get dilated. So anything which scratches those blood vessels causes them to bleed. So here, here's a, a little review. Um, everything that I just told you of fat-filled pockets, function is to reabsorb water, main function from undigested material, and then it stores that. So that's why, you know, it takes time for that to pass. You have kind of, through, throughout the day, you have about three waves that come. If the time and place is not adequate, then the urge to defecate goes away. And then again, you'll have a second wave of wanting to defecate come again. If the time and place does, is not adequate, it will pass away, and then, you know, it goes. So uh, it's easy to control when you want to defecate, okay? So let's take a look at some questions. Yes, the function is to prevent material going back to the ileum, not prevent material from entering the cecum. You do want material to enter the cecum. The undigested food, the ileocecal valve will relax when food, when that comes, when the ileum needs to push it in. So it will go from the ileum to the cecum. Remember, everything was one way. So it has to go from the ileum to the cecum, but you do not want it to go backwards. So it's to prevent the ileocecal valve would prevent this from going from the cecum back into the ileum. 